In this video, we're going to be talking about uh, samples and sampling distributions. All right, so at the beginning of this section, kind of this, this third section of the course, where we go through the last three chapters that we're going to cover, what we're ramping up to is uh, making inferences, making more inferences and testing inferences about our populations using sample statistics, right? That's kind of what the entire field of statistics is all about. And now we're really ramping up and getting to that and putting a bunch of pieces that we've already seen uh, together to be able to do this. All right, so when we talk about sampling, all right, this is something that uh, most of us do uh, almost every day, if not every day, to help us make decisions, all right? Um, it's the most kind of cost-effective and time-effective uh, way of making decisions, right, uh, is, you know, by taking samples, right? So, for example, if you are making uh, a meal, right, preparing some food, uh, and let's say that it's just for simplicity's sake, let's say it's a, a soup or a stew, right, uh, and you want to make sure that it, you have put all the right ingredients in there or just make sure that it doesn't need anything extra, right? Um, you're not going to eat the entire pot of stew to make that decision, right? You're probably going to, whatever stick you're stirring it with, you're going to dip it in there, right, and taste it off the stick, and you're, you're probably going to just put that stick right back in there, which is kind of gross, but I do it, so, you know, that's not really a, a ringing endorsement for it just because I do it, but I think probably most people do, so we won't, we won't worry about it, all right? But you're going to get a, a small part of the whole, right? Uh, and you're going to use the information you gain from that small part to make decisions about the whole itself, right? Uh, in kind of a statistical aspect, right, or a statistical realm, we do this, right, by taking a sample, right, collecting a sample of data, right, and using that to make inferences about a population, right? One of the main reasons we do this is because in order to get the population data, we're gonna to have to put in a lot of work, right? Um, it's very time consuming, or at least it can be. Um, it can be very time consuming, can be very costly, and in some cases, it's just not possible to get population data. So uh, sometimes it is necessary, um, and sometimes it's just convenient for us to use sample data. All right, one of the important things that we need uh, in a sample is uh, that it's going to be similar to the population, all right? Uh, if the sample is not similar to the population, uh, we're not going to get very good results, all right? So, uh, but if we have a representative sample, right, uh, a sample that looks a lot like the population, then the information that we gather from that sample uh, is going to be almost as good as information we would get from population data. Right? It's not going to be as good, but as long as, you know, depending on the degree of representativeness, right, it's going to depend on how good or right, how close to that uh, information, that population data, uh, the sample measures are going to be, right? So the more, uh, the closer we are, the closer our sample is to looking like the population, right, the better the information, right, the, the more confident we can be in those uh, in, in any inferences that we make about that population. All right. uh, on the flip side, if we don't have a representative sample, that can give us misleading results. Right? Um, so, for example, let's say that we were trying to estimate the average amount of money uh, an American spends on personal grooming in a month. Right? Uh, and we go out and we collect a sample, and we find that our sample is full of men. All right, is that going to be a problem? Uh, and hopefully we instantly say, yes, that is a problem, right? That is a problem. If what we are trying to uh, look at is average, you know, cost of personal grooming for Americans in a month, uh, it's not quite how I said it, but it had all the parts in there, right? Uh, then we're leaving a, a large section of the population out, right? Uh, men are not the only members of the American population, right? There are other members of that population, and by only having men in the sample, right, we are not representing the others, right? So, in and of itself, just 
not not representative, right? But there's also a reason why this would cause a problem beyond that, right? Uh, and the reason for that is because men and women, right? When you're looking at how much their uh, personal grooming stuff costs, there is a difference, right? Um, men's razors, deodorant, shaving cream, all that kind of stuff, uh, generally speaking, is less expensive than the counterparts that are marketed towards women, right? This is known as the pink tax, right? Kind of the idea is that you take a razor, you put blue on it, you give it to a man, it's one cost, you put pink on it, you increase the price, right, and give it to a, uh, a woman, right? Um, so, if the if there is kind of this fundamental difference in cost, right? So uh, even if two individuals are buying essentially the exact same products, the exact same bundle of goods, right? Um, on average, uh, a woman is going to pay more for those goods if she's getting the, the ones that are marketed towards and targeted towards women, right? And so that would be a problem because our population, um, or excuse me, our, well, yeah, our population is not represented accurately in the sample. All right, um, another time we might see some of this happening is when we implement a type of sampling that is very popular these days, especially with uh, the internet and social media, and that's voluntary sampling. With voluntary sampling, the members of the sample opt in, right? So they choose to be in the sample, right? So why might this be a problem? Right, so, uh, well, actually, before we talk about why this might be a problem, kind of uh, the classic example of this, at least nowadays, are uh, Facebook polls, or I guess, uh, I think Twitter has polls. Some other people might have polls, I don't know. Um, but kind of polls on social media, right? Um, just pop it up there, and then whoever sees it and wants to chime in, uh, can, right? Uh, so this can lead to uh, results that aren't quite, um, that, that you know, perhaps don't actually represent the truth, right? Um, and the reason for this is because when you are uh, using voluntary sampling, when people are able to opt in um, to a, uh, a sample, um, you're going to get a particular type, or you're more likely to get particular types of individuals, all right? Uh, and namely, that is people with strong feelings on the subject, all right? Uh, because to opt in, you know, you may have to make some it's just as easy to, to not do it as, uh, actually it's easier not to do it, it's easier to just not, not care, not uh, participate in the sample, right? But it is going to have some cost of participating in the sample, right? Those, those costs might be extremely low, like just, you know, taking the time to quit scrolling through and, and actually read the stuff and click on it, right? That might be all it is, the cost might be higher, but, the, just the presence of costs means that somebody's going to need a benefit to actually participate in this sample, right? Um, kind of some, some self-motivated benefit, right? Uh, if you're ambivalent about a topic or you only kind of care, right, one way or the other, um, the reward you're going to get, right, um, for participating in this sample is going to be very low, right? And the costs are more than likely going to outweigh the, the benefit, right? And so uh, people who are kind of in the middle um, and don't really care that much, all right, one way or the other, they're not gonna be represented in the sample to the degree that they should be, right? Um, even people a little bit further out probably are not gonna be as well representative. Uh, but if you have very strong feelings, whether negative or positive, the benefit that you're going to receive from participating in this sample is going to be much higher than the cost, right? Or, or it's likely that they will be, 
right? And if your benefit is higher than the cost, you're going to participate in the sample. Right? Uh, and so we're going to find, right, or we do find, that when we use voluntary sampling, that we are going to see the results skew to those extremes, right? to those uh, really strong positive uh, emotions or feelings and towards those really strong negative emotions or feelings. Right? Uh, and more often than not, it, it pulls towards the negative side of things. Right? And so uh, voluntary sampling is not always, uh, or it's not, not, not that it's not always, it's just not a very good sampling method, right? Um, it's possible that you would get a representative sampling, uh, sample uh, using voluntary sampling, but it is highly unlikely, right? Um, uh, right uh, so when we, if we were to use something like voluntary sampling, uh, this is going to open us up to what is known as selection bias. So selection bias, as we can see, the, the, as I just wrote up here, right? This is bias caused by the method of obtaining the sample, right? Uh, so some something about how you obtain the sample uh, leads to bias, right? Um, and that's exactly what we would see uh, when we have voluntary sampling, right? The method, right, by allowing people uh, to opt into a sample, right? You are all right, causing there to be, if not bias, the a, a higher probability that there is bias. All right, just by the way, the sample was obtained. All right, um, this is not our voluntary sampling is not the only way for us to have selection bias. We can also get selection bias in another way. Uh, your textbook in one of the little side paragraph things uh, talks about uh, one of. Uh, FDR's elections were one of the elections that he was involved in. All right, uh, and there were two uh, two groups or people polling. Right, there was a uh, kind of a magazine or a publication that had been uh, predicting the uh, elections and had predicted correctly um, since 1916. So I mean, that's like 20 years by the time they got to this election. So not that impressive, but all right. Um, Regardless, um, but they were highly uh, respected, well-respected uh, individual uh, pollers, right? Um, and the other individual who made a poll, right, was uh, Gallup. So probably famously of Gallup polls, right? So we probably tell who who is going to uh, win this fight, right? So this established group, they uh, polled uh, people and they drew their sample from those that. Uh, either uh, owned an automobile or uh, had a telephone. So anybody uh, that was in either of those two groups, all right, those were who they were uh, polling from, uh, and they found that, um, or they predicted that FDR's opponent, um, who, according to the little blurb, uh, was kind of more elitist or more concerned with um, kind of uh, people that, that had a higher um, higher wealth, um, they projected the that guy to win, right? FDR's opponent, right? Gallup uh, polled slightly differently, or right? used a different different way of obtaining his sample uh, and predicted that FDR would win, right? Uh, ultimately, we probably tell uh, just from what we remember of history uh, that FDR won, right? Um, and the reason for this is because, and the reason that this well-established uh, publication was wrong and they predicted incorrectly has to do with the selection bias, right? Uh, by only polling individuals who either owned a car or uh, had a telephone, uh, especially at that time in the 1930s, that was the social elites. Those were very wealthy individuals, 
right? And so uh, that's going that was going to skew in favor of the candidate that was favorable towards the wealthy and towards the elites. And underrepresented people that, that did not want that. So all that to say, uh, voluntary sampling is, uh, is a source of selection bias, but it is not the only source. There are other sources, uh, and we have to be careful uh, not to have selection bias uh, or any other bias. Right? Um, and although we probably all have a pretty good idea of what bias is, uh, we're going to write a quick little definition down anyways. All right, so bias, just bias in general. Uh, this is anything that's going to cause us to uh, over or under uh, estimate uh, as some segments of the population. So whether we are overestimating people with really strong uh, opinions when we are doing or when we're practicing voluntary sampling, right, or we are uh, underestimating uh, the people that are not interested in kind of the the wealthy and the uh, elite. Um, in the, the secondary example, right, uh, that's where we're going to see bias. All right, so uh, in order for us to avoid bias, um, one of the key things that we try to do is, uh, is randomness, right? Or the, the things that we rely on is randomness. Um, if we randomly select our sample, right, or, or have it randomly selected for us, then that's gonna give us a better chance of avoiding bias, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that we're gonna get a perfect uh, sample uh, and that we're gonna get the uh, sample that is most like the population every single time by uh, using this technique, but it does make it more likely. Uh, we're not going to talk a whole lot about sampling methods. Um, anything that we're going to talk about really is, is basically we've already done kind of really just picking on voluntary sampling, which to be honest, it kind of deserves it because it's not really, really accurate. Um, but what we want is, is random sampling, but we're not going to get too into how to do that, right? Uh, depending on what you're trying to measure, uh, the resources you have available, um, kind of what field you're in, uh, all of those things are going to play a part in how you're going to sample. Um, and if you can, as you continue on, if you continue to take statistics classes, you're going to get into some field specific statistics classes, right? Uh, but right now we're, we're essentially gonna leave it at, we want random samples, right? Um, there are, a bunch of different ways to do this, right? Um, if we were able to have all the members of a population uh, somewhere, whether it's in a, on a sheet of paper, in a, in a book, uh, on the computer, in, in some database, uh, if we were to go in and, and you know take every twentieth, two thousandth, you know whatever, right? Observation, right? Just randomly select those, right? That would be kind of that that random sample. Right, that kind of thing, and that's kind of described in the book. Uh, it's not really realistic. Uh, it's not something that we're going to be able to do a lot of the times. Um, and so we have to come up with different ways to make sure that we have randomness in our samples. All right, and to make sure that we aren't, aren't including any type of bias. All right, um, for example, all right, let's say that we're looking at medical trials. Right, um, one of the ways that they try to prevent bias is narrowly, narrowly focusing their uh, population, all right? Um, you know, women who are 50 years older, old or older, uh, or even, you know, 50 to 65 that have uh, leukemia, all right? Uh, or, or, or something along those lines, right? They're gonna focus that population so that there's not gonna be as much room for, for bias, right? It's gonna be easier to identify the members of that population and to randomly select 
uh, from there, right? Um, and then they might go on further to get a sample and then further divide it again, right? Randomly separate that sample into different groups, right? So again, kind of there's a lot uh, of stuff that goes on with uh, sampling uh, and a lot of uh, field specific stuff, right? But uh, bottom line, randomness can help us avoid bias. So now we're going to talk about sampling distributions. All right, so sampling distributions uh, are similar to uh, other, other distributions, right? Uh, we've already been looking at distributions, specifically probability distributions. Uh, we looked at the, some probability distributions for different types of data, for especially for continuous data. That's what it is uh, in most resembles, right? So, when we uh, were looking at that, right, we were looking at the normal uh, distribution, we were looking at the standard normal distribution, those were for our X's and our Z's respectively, right? Well, now we've got uh, a new type of distribution, right? The sampling distribution. This is the uh, probability distribution for a point estimator, right? That's what a sampling distribution is. Right. Um, a point estimator, we've been dealing with point estimators uh, for uh, a lot of this semester, uh, but these are single value estimates. That are calculated from sample data. intended to be close to the uh, population parameter. Alright, so we're going to be talking uh, kind of generally about point estimators uh, for a little bit, and then we're going to move on to some specifics. Uh, but just for reference, just so we know, uh, a point estimator is uh, something like the sample mean, or the sample variance, or the sample standard deviation. Right? These are single value. Once we go through the process, we are going to get a single value that is meant to estimate the population parameter. Right? Sample mean is meant to estimate the population mean x bar is used to estimate mu, right? Uh, so these are point estimators, right? So one thing I want to make clear is that the formula, kind of the, the concept of the sample mean, that is the point estimator, right? Um, kind of the formula that we use to find the point, the, the estimate, right? The estimate is once we, you know, shoved a bunch of numbers in there, done all the calculation, it spits out a single final value. That is the estimate, right? Um, so estimator is what we use to get the estimate. We use the uh, sample mean formula, sum of xi divided by n, to get our, our sample mean, our actual numerical single value answer. All right, so, <clears throat> A point estimator can be considered a random variable, right? Uh, and the reason for this is because the point estimator, really the kind of the, the final result once we, we put some numbers through, right? Um, we don't know what our estimate is going to be until we, we put until we collect some data and then put it through the the the, the estimator, right? Until we actually calculate it, right? So the value that we get from the point estimator is determined by the sample that we collect, right? So there are as many uh, outcomes for the point estimator 
right? The point, ester could, uh, point estimator could equal as many uh, different things as there are samples, right? So as many samples as we have, we have that many uh, point estimators, all right, point estimates, all right? Um, and that is, is going to be random, right? Especially if we are randomly selecting our samples. All right, we're not guaranteed that our point estimator is going to produce an estimate that is equal to or even close to the population parameter that we're trying to estimate, right? Uh, but if we know some of the characteristics about its distribution, then that can help us uh, kind of reduce the, the probable error, right? How much, how the, the likely mistakes we're gonna make. We can, we can shrink that, reduce that as much as possible uh, with some of the stuff we're gonna be talking about in uh, right now. All right, so as we mentioned, uh, the sample mean is a point estimator. Uh, it is the point estimator of the, pop or a point estimator of the population mean, I should say. Um, uh, so we're going to focus on it just as kind of a, a way of illustrating the ideas about the point estimator and also because we are going to be focusing on the sample mean. The sample mean is very important, so we're going to want this information uh, in the next couple of chapters, right? so we're going to just focus on it. All right, so talking about the sampling distribution of the sample mean. All right, I'm not going to write that header up because this board is very small and I do not have a lot of space. All right, uh, but all right, we know that the sample mean Sample mean x bar is a point estimator for the population mean mu. All right, so one of the things that we would want to know, all right, uh, and I meant to mention this earlier, but say la vie. Um, what we, what are the the concepts that we are going to want to know about a point estimator and about the distribution, all right, we're going to kind of want to know the central value, right, and we're going to want to know the variability of the estimator. Right, so where would we expect that estimator to fall? And then also, how, how much variation are we gonna see in that? All right, um, so kind of starting with the idea of the central value. All right, so again, X bar, point estimator of mu. So the idea is that whenever we calculate a sample mean, whenever we calculate X bar, we expect or we should hope that it is going to be close to the population mean, right? Um, and that is the very idea behind a concept called unbiasedness. So, uh, when we're talking about unbiasedness, a point estimator is unbiased if the average value is equal to the population parameter that it's estimating. Again, uh, a, point, uh, a point estimator is unbiased if it's uh, average or expected value, so those are synonymous, right? Average or mean, right? Expected value, those are equal. The expected value is the mean. Um, 
is equal to the population parameter being as, uh, uh, estimated. So for x bar, this is what that would look like. All right, so right here we're saying, so mu with a subscript x bar, this is saying this is the population mean for the sample mean, right? So uh, if we were able to calculate all of the sample means for uh, something, right, uh, some, some variable, uh, and then we were to average all of those sample means, that would be the population mean, right? Uh, the, so the, the population mean of the sample mean is equal to the expected value of the sample mean. So what, what do we expect the, the sample mean to be kind of on average? Uh, and that is equal, that should be equal to mu, right? So this is the population mean of x, right? So this is our random variable, right? So let's say we were looking at the average, I don't know. Um, well, let's just go with the first thing that, that popped in my head, the average length of bananas, right? Um, x would be the average length of bananas, um, or x, excuse me, x would be the length of bananas. X is just the length of bananas. X bar would be the average, the sample uh, length, the sample mean, the sample average of those bananas. Right? This would be the mu x bar would be the average of the average length of a banana. That's really complicated. We're not going to worry about this. Right? This no subscript. It's for x. It's our random variable. Anything else is going to have a subscript. So if you see mu x bar, sigma x bar, right? anything like that, it's telling you that this is the mean or the whatever for whatever that subscript is. So again, mu x bar is the population mean of the sample mean, right? So taking the average of all the means we could calculate, expected value, that's essentially the same thing. Mu by just mu, no subscript, that's the population mean for our random variable, the original. So one of the ways it's helpful to think about these estimators, we can think of them as, um, I'm gonna use a crossbow, all right? So we can think of these estimators like a crossbow, right? Um, it is the kind of machine by which we try to hit some target. And that is what we are trying to do, hit a target. So our estimator is designed to hit the center of the target, and the center of the target is the population parameter. All right, so our sample mean is the crossbow. The center of the target is the population mean. All right, so crossbow is x bar. Center of the target is mu. All right, uh, we're gonna load bolts into that crossbow or you know data. All right, and then fire it. Right, uh, and that's gonna give us actual x bars. Right, so instead of x you know, sum of xi over n, the actual formula, it's gonna give us an actual number, right? 28.3, 27.9, right? Those are gonna be the individual dots on the board. So let's say again that this is, uh, the center is the, the mean, right? It's the center of the target. For a estimator to be unbiased, right? The average distance, right, of those, um, those dots need to kind of converge in the center, right? If you, uh, so for instance, right? So if this was the central point and you were saying, well, it's, you know, this, this dot is this far away from the target. This dot is this far away, right? And you were able to take into account the fact that this is, you know, over this way and this one's down this way, so on and so forth, right? The average, right? If you're able to average all of those values, they should kind of hit the, the center, right? All right, I'm not the, the, the you know, most, uh, visually gifted person, but you know, if we saw something like this, we would say that this is 
I'm biased, right? Um, it's conceivable, uh, given my poor drawing skills, uh, that the center of these dots, right, if we were able to find the exact center of the dots, would hit the circle, right? So this would be an example, a poor example, but an example of an unbiased estimator, right? They are, again, kind of on average, the idea is on average, you're hitting the middle of the target, right? Uh, and if you're not hitting the middle of the target, it's, it's much more likely that you're gonna get close to it, right? However, if we change this a bit and we add a couple more dots, Right now, it doesn't look like the, the average, if we averaged all of those dots, it probably wouldn't hit the middle, right? If we were to find the, the middle of these dots, it would probably be somewhere over here because you got all of these values pulling it up upwards, all right? So this would be biased. So this, this would be an example of a biased estimator. Okay. Um, so we don't want biased estimators, right? So first and for foremost, we want an unbiased estimator. Uh, luckily for us, uh, the sample mean is an unbiased estimator. So X bar is an unbiased estimator of mu, right? And S, or the sample standard deviation, is an unbiased estimator of sigma, the population standard deviation. All right, um, normally uh, in class I would show the, um, show this and actually prove that the unbiased, that X bar is the unbiased estimator of mu, uh, but in the, for the sake of keeping this video short-ish, uh, we will forego that, right? Uh, but it's a very simple proof uh, if anybody's interested in, in mathematical proofs. Uh, it's, it's a pretty simple one. You can just uh, Google uh, proof that X bar or the sample mean is unbiased, all right? Um, and it's, it's pretty simple, and if you like that kind of stuff, it's, it's enjoyable to see. All right, but we will move on and talk about variability. So kind of that idea of unbiasedness, we're looking at uh, central value, the where it's gonna land, uh, if we can be confident that, we, if we can expect it to land close to the population mean, right, that's gonna be a good thing. Right, now let's move to variability. All right, the uh, standard error, and that's, what, that's the kind of the, what we're talking about with variability. The standard error is the standard deviation of a point estimator, right? Or you could say the other way around, uh, the standard deviation of a point estimator is the standard error. All right, it's very similar in concept, well, I was about to say it's very similar in concept to a standard deviation. The reason, and it is, and the reason for that is because, as we just said, it is a standard deviation, right? So it's gonna give us the idea of kind of how much variation we're gonna see kind of um, uh, 
Well, how much variation are we going to see? Really? I mean, there's not much more to, to say, right? It's called the standard error for a reason, right? What's the standard amount of error we're going to make, right? Uh, how, how much of a mistake are we going to make from iteration to iteration, do we think, right? Um, how, how off are we going to be? All right. So uh, when we're calculating the standard error for uh, the sample mean, there are two ways to do it. Um, uh, one is for the, uh, for, there's two ways to do it for two different assumptions, right? So uh, I guess one way for each assumption, just, you know, there's not four ways to do it. But let's look at those, all right? So first we're gonna look at uh, the assumption that we have an infinite population. All right, so if we're assuming an infinite population, then the standard error is, uh, so, so uh, the way we would symbolize it, right, for the population standard error, sigma subscript x bar, that's telling us, you know, it's the standard deviation of the sample mean. So sigma x bar equals sigma over the square root of n. All right, so uh, this one, right, this is our standard error the standard deviation of the mean. This is the standard deviation of x. So standard deviation of x bar, standard deviation of x. That's a better way of saying it than I did earlier with the, the means, right? Um, but it's a, it's a similar concept, All right? Um, so that is uh, if we can assume an infinite population. Uh, if we are under the assumption that we have a finite population, uh, that's going to slightly change our calculation. All right, uh, and the change is that we're going to add this term in front of, we're going to multiply kind of the, the infinite value by this term, right? Uh, so for a finite population, uh, the standard error is equal to the square root of n minus n over, uh, so capital N minus lowercase n divided by capital N minus 1, right, times sigma over the square root of lowercase n, right? Um, so square root of the population size minus the sample size divided by the population size minus one times sigma, right, or the population standard deviation for x divided by the square root of the sample size. All right, so the good thing about this, um, and we're just gonna kind of cut to the chase, um, we're not gonna really need to know this one um, in like, two minutes we're going to talk about something where this is the only one that we need. Um, a lot of the times we're going to be using this infinite population assumption. Um, if we have a finite population and we know how big it is, um, unless it's just going to be, unless it's just really costly to get that information, we might just go and get that information, right? Um, otherwise, uh, we're not going to know how big it is. We couldn't specify n. We would have to assume an infinite population um, or, or, or make some other assumption, right? Um, so we're not going to really worry about this too much, all right? But it is, it is there, right? There are some cases when you would need to use it. Um, to be honest, I haven't really run across any as of yet, but um, it is there, right? Uh, however, while we've got both of these up here, uh, one key thing for us to look at is I want us to talk about what happens to our standard error as the sample size increases. All right, so this is a very important um, feature of our standard error. It's similar to our variance and our standard deviation as well, all right? But this is um, this is important, all right? So. When we're looking at our, especially, it's very easy to see with the infinite population, right? If we were to increase our sample size, increasing our sample size is going to increase the denominator of our, our term, right? So uh, 
what we're dividing sigma by is going to increase. Right? Sigma is not going to change. Right? Sigma is set. So if the denominator, right, if the sample size starts increasing, the denominator starts increasing, and what happens to a fraction as the denominator goes up? Right? It goes down, right? The value of that fraction goes down. Right? We can see a similar thing here, right? Um, one through this this part, right? Uh, as n goes up, this term is going to get smaller because you're dividing sigma by an even ever, ever larger and larger number, right? But it also happens in here because you're subtracting the sample size from the population. So if you continue to just subtract, uh, you know, larger and larger numbers, right? Eventually, this is going to keep getting smaller and smaller, and this is going to shrink this term as well, right? So kind of the takeaway from this uh, is that, and I'll write this down uh, in a second as well, uh, but as the sample size increases, standard error goes down. So we can be more confident in our estimate, in our estimator, the higher we make that uh, sample size. So the higher, the larger our sample size, the better, the more confident we can be. Which uh, intuitively makes sense as well because the most confident we could be is with the population data, uh, and that is as much data as you can get. You can't get any more data uh, for your population than having all of the population data. So just to summarize some characteristics of the sample mean, uh, one, the expected value of the sample mean equals the population mean of x. Right, which tells us that x bar is an unbiased estimator of mu. Right, and what we just finished discussing, right, the standard error goes down as the sample size increases. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is what's known as the central limit there, right? So before uh, I start writing stuff down, we're, I'm just going to do it in like five seconds, but um, so as n increases, uh, not only does the standard error uh, decrease, uh, but the um, distribution of the sample mean starts moving closer and closer towards the normal distribution, right? This is going to be a very, very helpful, very important um, fact. All right, uh, but now let's talk about the, the central limit theorem, I and mean, this is kind of what this is kind of what leads into the central limit theorem, or leads to it. All right, just to, to clarify, um, so the fact that as n increases, the distribution of the sample mean. Uh, becomes closer and closer to the normal distribution, that is what leads into the central limit theorem. So uh, this is the central limit theorem. So the central limit, the central limit theorem states, uh, and it's a lot of stuff, so I'm gonna, actually, I'm just gonna say the first part. Um, if you Google the, the central limit theorem, you're gonna be able to find this. So um, if the, uh, if we draw a sufficiently large sample from our population, uh, then the distribution of the sample mean has uh, the three following uh, characteristics. All right, the first is that it has a, an approximately normal distribution, right? And this is regardless of what distribution the underlying data had, 
All right, so whatever our x is, it doesn't matter if it was normally uh, distributed, it doesn't matter if it was a, a binomial uh, distribution, of Poisson, uniform, doesn't matter, right? As if we have a sufficiently large uh, sample size, uh, then the sample mean, the distribution of the sample mean is approximately normal. All right, the second uh, is something that really is, is already true, uh, but just restating this, this idea of unbiasedness. The uh, expected value of X bar is equal to the population mean. And third, this is the one, uh, this is something that I, I, I referenced or alluded to earlier. And that is that the standard error uh, is equal to the uh, standard deviation divided by the square root of m, right? So if we have a sufficiently large uh, sample size, uh, then we don't have to worry about those finite population calculations, right? So we can uh, use the standard error that we would calculate under the assumption of an infinite population. All right, so said all of this stuff is true if we have a sufficiently large sample. So what is sufficiently large? All right, well, it's not really all that large. Um, so as long as the sample size is less than, no, excuse me, that's a, almost the opposite of what, um, what we needed, right? If the sample size is greater than or equal to 30, that is sufficiently large, right? So once we have uh, a sample size greater than or equal to 30, uh, the central, central limit theorem kicks in uh, and the distribution of the sample mean uh, has these three properties. All right, so. Why is this important? All right, the reason for, uh, well, the reason that these are important uh, is because it allows us to standardize our sample means. All right, so thinking back to uh, chapter four slash chapter seven, if we are looking at the uh, z-score, right? So standardizing, it means we're gonna calculate z-scores. Uh, if we're looking for at the z-scores for um, x, right? Uh, our, our random variable. This is what that looks like, right? Z equals x minus mu divided by sigma. All right. The standardization for x bar is going to be um, exactly the same, more or less, right? We're going to take our random variable, we're going to subtract the mean, and then we're going to divide by the standard deviation. For the sample mean, right, our random variable is x bar, our mean is mu x bar, and our standard deviation is the standard error. All right, however, we can transform this a bit. So we're not gonna do anything to X bar that's gonna stay the same, and rightfully so. Let's see if I can squeeze this stuff in here. All right, but we know, due to the fact that X bar is an unbiased estimator of the population mean, right, that the mean of the sample mean, so mu X bar equals the expected value of x bar, which equals mu. All right, so we can uh, make our numerator x bar minus the population mean. So the sample mean minus the population mean. All right, and we know that we're just gonna expand out our standard error. So we know that the standard error is equal to sigma divided by the square root of n. All right, so this is going to be our uh, z, right? This is uh, the formula to standardize our sample mean. All 
All right, so let's put this to use. Um, so I'm just going to kind of read the, the prompt and put the, uh, the important information uh, up there. All right, so this is a dumb example, uh, as most of mine are. All right, but let's say that you know that uh, everything bagels all right, are known to have, uh, well, no, excuse me, back up a second. All right, let's say we're looking at the number of calories in everything bagels, all right? And you know that the calories in everything bagels are known to have a population mean of 265 and a standard deviation of 37. say if we gather 45 everything bagels uh, and we find the average calories in those 45 bagels we want to we want to know what is the probability that the average is less than 280 at least a little bit, right? So again, the calories in, ba in these everything bagels have these properties, right? A mean of 265, a uh, standard deviation of 37, right? So if we get 45 bagels, right? If we get a sample, so this is so 45 is our sample size, right? We wanna know what is the probability that the average, the sample mean is less than or equal to uh, 208, all right? So, if we are going to answer this question, right, one of the first things that we probably want to do is go ahead and set up our probability statement. All right, so what we are actually saying is what is the probability that x bar, the sample average, sample mean, is less than or equal to uh, 280. All right, our Sample size is greater than 30, all right? Uh, kind of jumped the gun, but sample size is greater than 30, so we know that the central limit theorem kicks in and we can actually uh, standardize. So to find this probability, we can, ooh, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm gonna need more space than that. Um, so in order uh, to find this, we can standardize, all right? So, Z divided by, or excuse me, all right, so the probability that X is less than or equal to 80, 280 is equal to the probability that Z is less than or equal to the standardized value, all right? To standardize it, we're gonna take our X bar, which is 280, we're gonna subtract the population mean uh, which is 265. Then we're going to divide by the population standard deviation, 37, and divide it by the square root of the sample size, 45. So once we punch this into our calculator, we're going to get um, a value of 2.72. And really, actually, Really, this, this really isn't any different than what we were doing in chapter seven, right? The only difference is that instead of X, it's X bar, right? We're slightly changing. So instead of, you know, sigma, it's sigma divided by the square root of N, so on and so forth, right? But really it's the, the exact setting, right? Especially once we get to this point, probability that Z is less than or equal to 2.72. Uh, we're gonna look on our chart, uh, it's less than, so we would just go to the number 2.7 on the first column. 0.02 on the top row where those intersect we're going to find our probability which would be 0.9967 all right so <clears throat> the reason that we did this i'll go ahead and tell you we're this is not really the main purpose of this this isn't um you know, standardizing these, these sample means is not going to be the main thing. Uh, one of the reasons you might have uh, figured out is that uh, part of the, the equation is 
you got to know the population mean and the standard deviation. Um, well, if I, if I know those, what I'm, why do I care about the sample means, right? Um, if I know the population mean and population uh, standard deviation, I'm not going to care that much, uh, more than likely, about the sam any sample measures, right? Uh, but the more important thing is just the fact that we can standardize them. Right, we're going to be using this formula later on in uh, different chapters. Um, we're going to be modifying it, we're going to be changing it, uh, and it's going to be very important later on. All right, but that is it for uh, chapter 8. I'll see you in the next video.